Molly Scott Cato was uh, the MEP for the Southwest of England from 2014 until January of 2020. Uh, she's now the Green Party of England Wales' spokesperson on finance and the economy. And we're going to be discussing the cost of living crisis um, and how the Green Party would tackle it. But before we delve into any of that, uh, I just want to say a massive welcome to Molly and thank you so much for joining us. Um, how are you doing today? Not very well, actually, Chris, but I think I'll get through an hour, so that's fine. How are you doing after all these hours of presenting? <laughs> I am. Uh, I'm also not doing great. I'm very, very tired. We're halfway through the show, and I'm also suffering from a bit of a cold. So um, yeah. I'm getting there, but uh, it's been a bit of a struggle today. Uh, but we'll definitely get through it. So, um, so let's let's crack on then. So. Uh, the cost of living crisis. Everyone's experiencing it. It's dominating the news and the headlines. What would the Green Party do to tackle the current crisis? Well, I'm sure you know, Chris, I have a reputation for being a bit of a girly swat. So I've got quite a lot of stuff that to say about this. So I suggest if it turns into too much of a monologue, you just interrupt me. Right. But uh, obviously we have had quite a lot of stuff to say all the way along. So a year ago, we came up with our five point plan. And um, that was largely about making sure people had enough money to afford their bills. That was the first step. And also making sure that the energy companies that were already making huge profits had to contribute those profits into the, the public purse and also making sure that we reduced energy demand. So the five things we were actually calling for were to invest in domestic energy security, massive ramping up of onshore uh, wind uh, particularly which has been blocked as you know um, offshore wind and solar so building energy resilience and energy security but also of course reducing prices because it's so much cheaper now to produce energy in that way than from fossil fuels then um, we also called for introducing what we called a dirty profits tax so a lot of parties have said oh let's tax these profits from the energy companies but they're seeing the north sea oil and gas as something of a bonanza and obviously from a green point of view we have to shut that down and move on to other forms of energy that aren't destroying the climate as quickly as possible so we didn't want to you know frame that in that way so we've called it dirty profits tax but obviously there is a lot of money to be made there and we think that should all be coming to pay for energy efficiency measures plus um you know, we, we, we always link it to our carbon tax, which is a policy we've had for a long time to drive fossil fuels out of the economy. Then we had a policy of extending fuel payments, which I think we actually announced in October. I think we announced it at Autumn Conference 21, where we are, said that everybody should receive £320. That actually seemed like quite a radical thing in those days before government stepped in and started giving people loads and loads of free money. But um, yeah, but, it, you know, as time went on and obviously that was before the invasion of Ukraine, um, we then had to considerably increase that. And so I'll come to that in a minute, but just to say right from the start, we've been very focused on people that have been largely ignored, I would say by the other parties, and that's people on welfare benefits who are living really on incredibly low incomes. And so we said that the there was a lot of debate then, you'll recall about the 20 pound universal credit uplift, which was, given to people during COVID, but it was then taken away, even though they were on incredibly low incomes. So um, we said that that should be restored and in fact doubled. And so everybody on benefits would get an extra 40 pounds. Now, a lot of people said, oh, that's not very much, but I think that just shows how out of touch people are with actually the levels of income people have when they're on benefits, because actually it was about a 50% increase to you know, the actual incomes um, people had on, on universal credit and a range of other benefits. So that's where we were with the five point plan. Then we got to um, the sort of spring of the following year and um, prices really going through the roof. And then, you know, I, every year I write the spring statement arguing with the chancellor. Imagine I was sitting in number 11 and um, we very much were in line with the TUC uh, this time last year, who produced a very good paper showing that actually we're not in a cost of living crisis we're in a wages crisis and it's the fact that people's wages have been suppressed for so long that has led to these poverty and in fact the strikes that we're seeing now and you know they pointed out that wages haven't been suppressed as much as this since the end of the napoleonic war which is a pretty astonishing statistic actually I'll just quote something from their report the UK stands out for its poor performance not just historically but internationally when comparing pay growth from 2008 to 2021, so since the financial crisis, 
The UK comes fifth from bottom of all OECD countries with an annual average decline of annual average decline of 0.2% against the OECD average growth of 0.8%. And I just point out that's before we've seen these really high rates of inflation. So, you know, people's living standards and wages were already being eroded before we had these um, big price rises caused by fossil fuel prices getting out of control. Since, and this is dating back to obviously 2010 and the introduction of austerity under the first Labour government. So since George Osborne introduced those cuts, public sector workers have faced a decade of pay restraint, which is a 5% real cut for education workers and 1.6% for health workers. You're going to ask me about the strikes in a minute. I'm on strike myself. I'm effectively 20% worse off than I was a decade ago, and I'm doing twice as much work as I was last year. I mean, I wouldn't have any self-respect, would I, if I didn't strike when that's what I'm being faced with. Um, Right, just to say we, we support some of the TUC's key demands from that report, and we're, we're the only political party that's supporting these, namely that pay rises for all public sector workers should not only match inflation this year, but we should look to repair the damage that's been done from 2010 to restore those lost earnings. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the uh, TUC said fully independent pay review bodies, but I think the pay review bodies have lost all credibility now, to be honest. And, you know, collective bargaining seems to be working better, as we see with the firefighters, hopefully also with the university. I'm hoping we'll get a better offer this week and maybe be able to accept it. Yeah. And um, obviously, all the way through this, we've had an underlying, you know, how are you going to pay for that? The answer is we would tax rich people more. It's actually fairly simple. We see growing inequality. We see the destruction of our public services. There is an answer to that. It's like moving more towards continental systems of taxation where people are expected to make a much larger contribution when they're on larger incomes. And actually, then you pay that into the public sector and it circulates around. And part of the reason we're not, you know, we have this productivity problem is that we're constantly penny pinching on, and that is itself withdrawing, you know, activity, withdrawing energy from the economy. So, so you know, I know you're going to ask me in a bit about, um, so I won't say about public, about um, why we said to nationalise the energy companies, because I think that's another one of your questions. But essentially, the question of ownership is really important here, because the value that's created in the economy is not not being shared widely enough and that's one of government's key roles and we would as a green government we would take that role seriously in fact we would proudly redistribute wealth a lot more address inequality and fund our public services properly so that leads me on nicely to what i was going to ask you this which is about the energy companies so obviously a huge portion of the current cost of living crisis is driven by energy and the cost of energy increasing um, and one of the things that the green party has called for as part of its response to the cost of living crisis and indeed the tuc has called for uh, as part of its response is for the big five um energy retail companies uh, to be brought into public ownership why do you think that's an important step and how would it address uh, the issues people are facing with their bills well, you can just look around, you know, look out of the window, look around our country and you see that the experiment with marketization that was started about 40 years ago has completely failed. You know, you can see it clearly with the water companies who are just like making massive profits, send them to foreign, you know, um, what sovereign wealth funds and foreign wealthy individuals, money that should be spent improving our waterways. There's no competition. Essentially, it fails because you know, I mean, even basic economic theory says if you've got a natural monopoly, i.e. there's only really one supplier, or if you've got an essential good like energy or water, then those don't work well in a market. Even, you know, even economists understand that. So it is just a sort of ideology that was brought in during the Thatcher era. Um, just privatise everything and it'll work better. Nobody really believed that. It was just a way of extracting more value from us. If you think about the cost of water now compared to the cost of water 30 years ago it's gone through the roof but that money's not improving our waterways it's just going into the pockets of shareholders so i think that's you know fundamentally um it's important to recognize that when you have a really serious problem only the government can have the power and scope to intervene at the required level so that's true of all our public services but it's particularly true in the case of energy because we've got a crisis on our hands here not just because people can't afford their energy bills but because the energy system we've got needs to be rapidly transformed to address the climate crisis and you know that just isn't happening with energy companies uh, whether it's the extraction end whether it's the distribution or whether it's just the the retail end <coughs> it isn't working you know we're not seeing the rapid transition we need to see in the public sector 
So anyway, just to address the price issue, we actually made a very radical call last August because the price cap had been allowed to increase. So the previous October, it had been 1,200, well, nearly 1,300 pounds. And then it had increased, I can't remember, I think more or less to 2,500 or something like that. That was going to be the price cap in April. And all the other parties were saying, oh, freeze the price cap for April, you know, don't let it increase again. But we said, we're already in a situation where people can't afford their bills. So we're going to have to take it back to the last time when they could afford their bills, which we said was October 2020, or no, October 2021. Now, once you set the price in a market like that, obviously you're finding and you're creating another reason why the market can't work because those companies are going to have to buy buy in at market prices, which are incidentally being bid up by speculative activity. <clears throat> and then they sell to their customers at previously agreed prices. So that would have caused the existing energy companies to go bust. So the, the reason we called for the nationalization of the energy companies was not primarily for the first reason, which is that we think energy doesn't work in a private market. It was actually primarily for completely pragmatic reasons, which is if you're going to have this massive intervention in the market because you don't want people to freeze to death, then you're going to have to send large amounts of money to the private companies. And we said, well, rather than sending them large amounts of money, let's just take ownership of them. And then we can make sure that they do the energy transition as well. So that was the argument that we made, which actually well, went, quite down, went down quite well. And again, wasn't something being said by other parties, although, as you say, it was an argument being made by the TUC. And then we had a bit, and this is still up for grabs, this bit of our policy. So if anybody's watching and wants to get stuck in, you know, please do. Um, so I made the case very strongly that we should have a differential tariff, meaning that you get your, that you get the, you know, what we don't want to do is make energy really cheap because we know that people should, we need people to be using less energy. So on the one hand, we call for investment in energy demand reduction, you know, in public programs to improve the quality of people's homes and install heat pumps and electrify the economy. We should be doing that at a government level. But at the same time, and then people wouldn't need, the energy would be more expensive, but people would have lower bills because they wouldn't need to use so much energy. That's our vision. So just saying, oh, endless amounts of cheap energy actually is not consistent with our policy. So, you know, my, my favoured option, although I'm not quite sure we've got agreement on this yet, but would be to give people a, a basic allowance of energy. And again, it's difficult to say what that should be and where the exception should be and so on. But you know, maintain a low price for a basic amount of energy. And then as people use more energy, make it increasingly more expensive. So you're putting into the system an incentive for people to use less energy. And again, link that with our carbon tax. And so um, again, we were asked how much this will cost. And that was quite difficult to work out. It's actually, you know, you're trying to cost something against a moving target all the time, because once the government intervened in the energy market, it, it stopped prices rocketing out of control. And it also brought inflation down. So incidentally there's a large chunk of change left now from their estimated costing of this policy and then gas prices went down anyway we we estimated 37 billion pounds and 2.8 billion pounds was the TUC estimate for for bringing the retail energy companies into public ownership and that was less than far less actually than they paid just to save bulb well when bulb went bust they had to shift a lot of customers who'd been offered very low prices and compensating those people actually cost more than it would have cost just to bring all the companies in all of the companies into public ownership and again you know we we well there's a my favorite tax change is ending the national insurance loophole if you if you charge people national insurance fairly so you pay as much when you're rich as when you're on a lower income then we that in itself would generate 24 billion pounds Anyway, so between that and extra VAT and um, ch changes and the dirty profits tax, we reckon we could fund that policy. So I'm going to stick on energy for a moment before uh, moving on to, I guess, a few other things. And so there's a great question that's come in from the chat from Steve C. Uh, so Steve asks, uh, would the Greens move away from energy being priced on wholesale gas prices? Well, um, I mean, you so... That's got that's a question that has quite a lot of different levels. I mean, I think you sh I think we should be looking more closely at how those wholesale gas markets are working. And I can't find anybody to do this work. And I don't know how to do it myself. But essentially, if Martin Lewis goes on the TV and starts saying, oh, my God, gas price is going through the roof, automatically that pushes gas prices up. Right. And the more people panic about the future price of gas, the more you can charge people in the future for their gas. So to some extent, 
that is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And there's definitely money being made in the futures trading markets for, for energy. And we should be finding where that money is being made and, and taxing it. And in that sense, yes, I think there should be more intervention in terms of how those markets work. But on the other hand, we still rely heavily on gas for because we, we did that dash for gas away from coal, which greatly reduced our CO2 output in the energy system. But we didn't go on and, and um, move on to renewables. And so um, the reason that, that energy prices are related to gas is that, you know, I'm on good energy green tariff, 100 percent renewable. But there are days when they can't buy renewable in the market and then they have to go in and buy electricity generated by gas to heat my home or I wouldn't get any electricity. And when they have to do that, that is the highest possible um, electricity to buy, the most expensive possible gas to, um, electricity to buy. And it's inevitably produced by gas because gas will be there when other sources aren't. Well, maybe, you know, they uh, no, I have a no, no nuclear requirement on my account. So, um, so there's a sense in which, because our electricity system is so dependent on gas, the ultim ultimately, the pricing will always be about gas until we've sorted out balancing the grid and organising storage and so on. Anyway, I'm I'm telling you everything I learned last summer about energy, which is far more than I ever wanted to know about energy. But, you know, a lot of people on this call know a lot more about the energy market than I do. But I can tell you there's been scamming going on this past year. You can see that if you compare the, the futures prices and then what happened to gas prices, Prices were bid up and up and up, up to the point when government said, OK, we'll pay. And then prices started, so prices started coming down. So, you know, it wasn't it was working like a market, but it was working like a speculative market. And it should be working like a, a basic commodity market, in my view. And I think that at the European level, they tried to, to do more work on that, but it was all tangled up with dependence on Putin. But I think ultimately there should be a you know, I think we should get a grip on the energy companies, both to make sure that they're not profiteering for something so basic, but also to make sure that they are rapidly managed out of existence, basically, the fossil fuel companies. So I'm going to move on now to talk a little bit more long term. So obviously, a lot of the things we talked about at the beginning of this conversation were kind of short term interventions that you can make to alleviate the current crisis. Um, but I guess what you've talked about and alluded to in the rest of the conversation is that actually this crisis isn't uh, isn't isn't solely built in immediate geopolitical or um, economic circumstances. It's it's been baked into the economic system that we we have, and it has deep roots. So, what are the long term shifts in the um, the UK's economic policy that the Greens would like to see that would prevent future crises like this these reoccurring? Well, I think, again, going back to what I was saying at the beginning about marketization, the most important thing is that we raise those questions about ownership and who owns economic productive capacity and how they come to own it. And if they do own it, then are they paying sufficient tax on the value that they generate from that? that those are the absolutely fundamental questions that effectively the sort of the answers to those questions were radically changed during the process of neoliberalization from about 1980 onwards first in the UK and then elsewhere and we really need to put those questions back on the table and again that's a job for us as the Green Party because Labour have obviously under Corbyn Labour had those questions there and jo I'm a big fan of John McDonnell I think it would have been fantastic if he'd been Chancellor apart from possibly specul speculation against him but anyway he would have you know I mean he was very close to what Greens think about economic policy actually but, uh, you know, this Labour Party is just not going to raise those questions. And so they're going to really struggle to achieve anything they want to achieve if they're not prepared to make different sorts of demands on the value of production and on the ownership of, of the um, means of production, actually. So um, we would take a, we would just take a more empowered approach, I would say, to thinking this is our economy. You know, the fact that businesses are running parts of it doesn't mean we don't all have a right to share in the value of that. And that's a, about deciding where the limits to the market are, what should be in public hands and where it's in private hands, taxing more strongly um, and taxing the wealth of people who've accumulated wealth through this um, system more strongly as well. Um, I think it's clear that, well, this is our policy. We, we, in a sense, for pragmatic reasons, as I explained before, but also because of um, the desire to have greater equality, we have we, we ask serious questions about where the limits of the market should be. So, for example, we're very clear there should be no role for the market in public services, basic public services. So that's health, also education, also universities. Um, 
And then we have essential services like energy and water and so on. And again, we're clear that those should be socially owned in some way. So you can't make a profit from them, essentially. If something's necessary for people to live, you shouldn't be able to make a profit from it. I think that's our basic principle. And on that basis, I would really question the so-called private housing market as well. I mean, I don't, you know, we, we have policies that would really intervene strongly in the housing market, like in stopping evictions and rent controls and so on. But if I'm correct, and the principle is something that you need, that's an absolutely fundamental requirement, shouldn't be controlled in the market, then I can't see why housing doesn't go in that box as well, actually. That's not our policy. I have to say that as a spokesperson. But I, I just, struggle just to, to see the difference between that and the other things I've mentioned. Just to pick up on that quickly, actually, because it's an interesting one. And the, the, the question that it raises in my mind is, is food, right? In that food is a basic necessity that people need uh, for life. And I guess the, the logical extension of your argument would be that food shouldn't be subject to, to the market either. Well, I, I did actually propose that. But so various governments do put a maximum price on types of food. I mean, like, especially like i mean egypt has a maximum bread price doesn't it or always used to anyway maybe pakistan as well that's because if people go hungry they go out rioting and they overthrow a government so you know it's a fairly um it's a it's a fairly pragmatic response to that really but yeah i think um i don't know i think the trouble is with food it's not like a, a it's not like a house is it there's lots of different types of food you want to have the freedom to choose the problem with say i mean you could potentially especially when food prices are just rocketing out of control like they are now, you could put maximum prices on food. You could also subsidize um, food so that it reaches that price. You could also certainly end speculation in food prices. I mean, a lot of the reason wheat, oil, basic commodities like that are so expensive is because people, again, using the Ukraine war. Um, so some of that's real, but a lot of it is also speculative. And although that's making prices very high for us here it's actually make it causing starvation in other countries where people depend on those basic commodities so yeah i mean it's another one well we're debating this now and it's definitely worth debating but i think where we are as greens is thinking that you know um markets work well for basic commodities because un unless you say have a system where it's like you know there's five things you can have to eat flour sugar oil you know, and they're all in state shops and they're all at fixed prices, then what people do is they spend more money on beer that they could be spending on bread. And we say, well, that's absolutely your choice to do that. So I think that's, yeah. I mean, I, I think the market works well in terms of allowing people to express their preferences with their income. So it's more our responsibility to make sure they have adequate income to express those preferences. And that's where the attack on income inequality comes in, I think. Um, Anyway, going back to, to some of the other key points, which I think are really important. Obviously, the UBI is, is very important in terms of our policy. And I don't, I mean, that is, it's important because it gives people freedom, but it's also important because it gives people more power in the labour market. You know, the sort of work or starve mantra um, is the reason people go and do awful jobs and destructive jobs and soul destroying jobs and so on. And even though the UBI will be at quite a low level, I think it would really it would allow people to choose the kind of work they're doing. And similarly, you know, we're very strong on encouraging union membership. And I'm really encouraged to see that the consequence of the strike, far from people turning against the unions as the government expected, is that lots of people are thinking, oh, it's great to have somebody to stand up for you. I think I'll join a union too. So, you know, that's something that we, we very much encourage. And I think both of those things are about you know building the strength of, of labor in the workplace really and just of citizens never mind if if you're working or not but just yeah it, establishing citizens rights in the economy much more strongly so you mentioned the industrial disputes that are going on across the country right now obviously it's the biggest wave of industrial action for a generation you yourself are on strike and uh, many of the people in uh, a whole range of sectors and, and workplaces are um, taking industrial action, I guess, in response to the cost of living crisis. Um, what do you make of the current wave of strike action, both in terms of, um, I guess, in terms of like where it's come from, uh, I guess, in terms of what its impact will be on uh, labour relations and the power of labour versus capital in the long term, and also in terms of uh, how it could be, how, how, how the, the, the great strike wave, wave could be resolved? 
Well, I see it very much in that context of wages having been suppressed for the longest period since, you know, the Napoleonic War, because the Napoleonic War led to the, the in, increase of the franchise and reform bills and really significant political change, because people were just finding that their their um, they didn't have the power to ensure their basic needs were met. And that's what people are finding again now. And um, I think what's really encouraging, and I heard Francis O'Grady, Francis O'Grady talking about this on um, Question Time, and she was really brilliant, talking about how working people are standing up for themselves. And it's, you know, it does take a lot of pressure for people to do that because it's really disruptive going on strike and obviously you lose money as well. But, um, you know, it's really good to see people saying, well, I won't put up with this any longer. You know, I, like I said about my situation, doubled workload. I have no power to stop that. You know, they don't negotiate with you. They just impose work on you. And every year you get poorer. I mean, what, why would you put up with that? Why would anybody put up with that? And everybody, I can hear my indignation and everybody across the public services is feeling this same sense of indignation. But the, the problem with it is, and again, I think this is common right across the public services, is that you work in the public sector because you're caring about people in some way. You know, I'm educating young people so they have a chance of a better future. So are teachers, nurses are caring for people when they're sick, like doctors. And so you know that when you go on strike, actually the people that you came into work to help are suffering as a result of your strike action. So it's actually, you feel very conflicted. I feel very conflicted when I'm not there for my students. and. Um, you know, you hear nurses say the same. So you kind of have to reach the end of your tether before you do it. But yeah, well, we're all there, aren't we? Because because we've been pushed too far, basically. And you reach, I mean, in higher education, in my case, it's like just, I suppose, again, parallel with the nurses. It's not just the fact that I'm getting poorer. It's the fact that there's casualization. They're bringing in VLs. The quality of teaching is going down. It's turning into sort of mass market education. The quality of universities is being undermined. There's now a strong incentive to, to have foreign students and there's fewer places for British students because they just don't bring as much money in. So once you turn it into a business, which happened under the coalition government, um, you know, you're destroying the quality of the service. And that's also why UCU have come out on strike, the, the University and College Union. Uh, so that's very similar in the health service as well, that people are realizing that, yeah, people are dying because nurses are on strike but on the other hand people were dying anyway and the same with ambulance drivers because the, the, the quality of the service has been so undermined by lack of funding that um yeah it's not possible to run a safe service and so I think I think that's the other thing you know if you're a professional working in public service it just it just goes against the grain to go to work every day knowing you're not providing the service that you should be providing and I think that's and that's also people recognize that that's why there's such strong support for the nurses, because people have been in hospital and they've got, you know, their parents have been in hospital and they understand what's happening. That, you know, the Tories are basically running the NHS into the ground. And so, yeah, that's why it's like these strikes are a bit different because it's like whatever sector you're in, people are saying, yeah, that's right. You know, we know that you're standing up for your students or your patients or whoever else and not just greedily asking for more pay and so that's why it feels like more of a social movement than an individual claim for better pay to be honest with you and that's that's the side of it I'm liking the side of it I'm not liking so much obviously losing a lot of money I mean I'm losing half my work days this month so that's a considerable part of my income but also conflict with other people that aren't in the union you know conflict with management so on so yeah that's that's not so much fun but I think yeah what keeps you going is the sense that there is strong public support. And I really think, you know, I was, you said that I ceased to be an MEP in January um, 2020, but you very politely didn't say Brexit. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I was sent home really, wasn't I? Um, but I, I think that vote for Brexit, people interpret it in lots of ways. But to me, it was, it was like the end of um, a long period of austerity. It was a vote of utter desperation by people who'd been oppressed by Tory governments. And David Cameron said, do this. And so they did the other thing. And obviously there was a lot of shit stirrers telling them things would happen that would help them if they voted for Brexit. But, you know, that vote for Brexit and then Johnson offering people the earth. You know, you can say, why on earth did people believe such a chancer? But on the other hand, the answer to that question is because they were so desperate, they were clutching at anything. And I think they've seen that both of those have failed. And now we're into the next phase, which is actually you know, workers expressing their right not to put up with this any longer. And where is it going? I mean, I'm astonished that the government is so stupid as to think they're going to ride this one out, because that's obviously not going to happen. 
people are furious and every time you, you strike you get more reinforced in that so the government's going to lose have they got the good sense to lose with some face in you know kept keeping some face and as offering us seven percent or whatever and like they've done with the firefighters i think probably not so i think you know, it'll just go on and on in more and more bitterness and eventually we'll get a Labour government and then they're going to have a real handful, aren't they? Because, yeah, unless they tax introduce a proper tax system, they're going to find it hard to give the pay rises that people need as well. But at, at least there won't be so much hostility to them. So I've got a couple of questions that have come in uh, to the chat on uh, slightly different topics, which I hope you don't mind if I put to you. Um, mm. So so the first of them has come from Pete Johnson. Um, Pete asks, um, many people, uh, many Greens believe that we need to have, ha- invest heavily into a move to a more sustainable society. How can that be funded without spooking in the financial markets? Right. Well, I, I don't think there's a I, I challenge the, the dichotomy inherent in that question, if I'm allowed to do that, because the reality is capitalists are really keen on the green economy these days. So um, the issue is not green economy and financial collapse or not green economy and economic success. The choice is capitalist green economy, where we still see really unequal sharing of the proceeds or more you know, a green version of that, where we actually make sure that a lot of the energy production, for example, is in public hands and the value of that production goes into the public coffers and we tax the private companies properly and so on. So um, if you look at what's happening now with the subsidy programme that Biden's brought in and that the European Union has sort of responded in kind, we're seeing huge public subsidies now in both those major markets. And obviously the Chinese have been doing that for some time for green economic sectors and for a rapid shift towards green industry. So that's where the smart money is now. That's where that's where the market's going. So it's not, I mean, you know, I, I said that, I mean, if, if they're gonna speculate against a green government, it would be on the basis of our monetary policy and our tax policy, not on the basis of us wanting to build a green economy. And actually, the other point to make slightly more theoretical is that the current economy is destroying its own asset base. And so, you know, because it's creating stranded assets, property that will be flooded, um, fossil fuels that can't be burned, um, soil that's so poor it can't produce food, just in a whole range of areas now. Um, So really, money should be getting out of those areas. And that's one of the things I worked on as an MEP, creating the right incentives. So the, the stranded asset risks then become a pressure for for money to move in the direction of the green economy because unless we do that the the economic collapse the risk of economic collapse is actually because the stranded assets come home to roost i mean imagine the um you know the barrage in london fails and all that water floods into southwest london the property values that would be destroyed then are sufficient to that's what would spook the financial markets not people going through an orderly transition towards a green economy it's been an absolute pleasure, as always, Molly. Thank you so much for joining us and for um, answering a sprawling array of questions, uh, <laughs> some of which are outside your brief. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Chris. Nice to see you. Hope you feel better soon. Likewise, I hope you do too. <laughs> <laughs>